So welcome everybody. Today we are going to discuss branding with our keynote speaker Adam Harome with Branding MD. Adam specializes in helping companies raise their standard of individuality. His company looks at your entire marketing landscape from digital to offline and offers an all-inclusive branding solution for you. So the first time I actually saw Adam speak was at a conference in Arizona, and his energy and vision is absolutely contagious. We are very excited to have him here today, so we have a lot of questions to ask, but before we get started, let me introduce our council members. So today we have Stephanie Piester, who is Vice President of Sales at Senior View, Ryan Nisley, Corporate Sales Director for Presbyterian Senior Living, also a professor at Eastern University, Evan Coe, Director of Sales at Sherpa, uh, Nick uh, Nemmer, who is Vice President of Business Development at Life Loop, and Aubrey Roden, a National Account Manager for Site Staff and author. Well, thank you, Adam, for being our uh, featured keynote speaker today. And I'll go ahead and just dive right in with a question. So when it comes to creating a brand, what would you say are the key elements business owners should be considering today? Definitely. Well, I think the one biggest mistake I see a lot of business owners making is they think that their brand and their logo are really one and the same. And that's not quite the case. So, yes, you know, your company's logo is a reflection of your brand, but when we take it back a step and we look at what a brand really is, it's the sum of how your customers see, perceive, and experience your company, right? I'm going to say that one more time. It's how they see, perceive, and experience your company. So the way your reception staff answer the phone, that's the reflection of your brand. What your website looks like, that's the reflection of your brand. The quality of your products and services, that's definitely a reflection of your brand. So every interaction you have with both existing and prospective customers, that is really an extension of your brand and a reflection of it. So when you ask what's most important to think about, it's really everything that has to do with how you're being seen how you're being perceived, and how you're being experienced. So there's no detail too little to overlook, but I'm sure we'll elaborate a bit more on what some of those key elements are. Just the one thing I really want people to understand is that your brand is so much more than your logo. Adam, what do you feel is the most important area to focus on when growing the brand? Definitely. So the thing people need to understand about branding is that your company's brand is kind of a living thing, if you will, right? It's not static. Your company is always evolving. The marketplace is always evolving. So the one thing, I actually would say it's three things people really should focus on as they're growing their company's brand are, again, I call these the three C's, right? So the first is clarity, right? You need to make sure that your audience understands what your company does and why you do it better than the company competition, right? So there's a clarity. That's your first C. The second C is consistency, right? So that means the way you look online is the way you look in your marketing collateral is the same way that you look, you know, in your physical location if your company has one or your software interface. And that the results and really the experience your customers have is consistent across every employee, every location, every interaction. So again, that's consistency. And the first C is clarity. The third C is what we call constancy, right? And that means that you are omnipresent. So your company doesn't just have an Instagram page. Your company isn't just doing Google ads or only doing trade shows, but that your brand is being seen in multiple different avenues uh, and really has that chance for the most exposure possible. So the three things to focus on, the three C's I like to call them, are clarity, again, what you do and you do it for and why you do it well, Consistency, you look the same way online and offline, and you have a consistent customer experience, and constancy. So you're omnipresent, and people are seeing you in more than one place. Uh, this is Evan, by the way, but how important is a recognizable logo in association with your company name? Definitely. So there's different kinds of logos, right? Some are what we call word marks. You know, as an example, FedEx is one of those. Um, a lot of fashion brands like Calvin Klein are another. Uh, then there's pictorials, which are things like, you know, um, the Logitech logo with their little eye or, you know, the McDonald's arch. 
Um, and then you have abstract logos, which is kind of like the flower for BP British Petroleum. So even though there's different kinds of logos, no matter what kind of logo you have, you want to make sure it's distinct and recognizable. Another part of that is your logo should be timeless, right? A well-designed logo should last your company between 5 and 15 years, right? So you don't want to pay some design firm all this money to create a logo for you, and in two years it's so trendy that it looks out of date. So definitely you want to be recognizable. You want, again, to have your logo last your, your company between 5 and 15 years. Um, and then you also want to make sure that it's timeless. Now, when it comes to being recognizable, the one thing you need to understand is your brain first recognizes color, then it recognizes shape, and then it recognizes the words in your logo. So color, shape words. So that's why it's so, so important to make something distinct, right? Very cool. Um, so this is Stephanie. And so speaking of timeless and trendy, in the senior living industry, a lot of us are trying to reach a um, less than youthful demographic. Sure. So how do you utilize social media, which is obviously a huge you know, not even a trend. It's just what it is now to um, to increase your your brand presence. So, how do you utilize social media to reach um, the the older demographics and increase your Definitely. brand? Definitely. So, there's a couple ways you want to look at this. So, the first thing is, and this can be different between one senior living operation and another, but look at who your buyers are. In many cases, it may not be the residents themselves, but it may be their families, right? So. What social media avenues are those individuals using? What age demographic are they in, right? Um, right. If you have buyers who are, you know, 35 to 50, uh, you probably wouldn't be on Snapchat, right? That's more of a platform for, you know, the 24 and under set. So <laughs> we first want to look strategically at who are your buyers and what social media platforms are they using. And then we really want to leverage that platform to deliver the message of what makes your particular offering unique compared to other senior living options in the marketplace. So all of that being said, I would say, you know, if a company came to me and said, we want to be on social media, but our demographic isn't there, I would say, first of all, you might be surprised, especially on Facebook, the demographics continue to skew older and older, and that you should really look at who your buyer is in detail and then determine what their pain points are, what their buying signals are, and really develop social media content on the right avenues, you know, for example, maybe not Snapchat, maybe not Instagram, maybe Facebook. It could be Instagram for some people. Again, that's going to look different for every operation depending on who the audience they're speaking to is. But really delivering your message, the right message, to the right platform. So don't think you have to do everything social because it's new and hot and trendy, right? I'm often known for telling clientele they might need a marketing make under, right? Do less, but do it effectively, <laughs> right? I'd much rather see a company using three social channels and executing them all flawlessly than trying to do eight different things, and they're all kind of half-baked, right? So, so Again, just to summarize, I would say know your audience, know what their pain points are, and then create a message and content that target those pain points with the right channels to reach that prospective buyer. Yeah, I think that's great advice. Um, and, and something also that kind of goes along with messaging is taglines, which I feel like have kind of lost popularity. I don't see as many, like, taglines going along with logos or going along with branding. How important do you think it is to create a memorable tagline to associate with your brand? With a tagline, you know, it doesn't have to necessarily be funny or especially catchy or cute. I mean, if a company can do that, great. But it really needs to convey what you do and why you do it differently. So um, what we're seeing right now is a lot of very short taglines, right? It might be three specific words. It might be a very brief uh, phrase. I'm all really in favor of taglines because if people, you know, I always use the analogy, if aliens landed on planet Earth and they need to find the senior living residents, um, what would they want to take away and learn about what your company has to offer, right? So it's a very succinct way of summarizing your key advantages. So taglines, they're not easy to come up with. You may want to do it in tandem with a marketing professional, but they really make your brand message that much stronger and that much more memorable in the mind of prospect, right? There's those classic examples like, you know, Nike, just do it, or, you know, Avis Car Rentals, you know, we're number two, but we try harder, right? Those taglines really do withstand the test of time. That's great, Adam. This is Ryan, by the way. Um, before I ask my question, I just have to make one comment. The Facebook uh, thing that you said, be careful prejudging. My grandmother's 92, World War II bride, and she's on Facebook more than I am. So, uh, there you anyway. go. <laughs> point proven. <laughs> exactly, point proven. So uh, I do have a question. This all sounds well and good. My question, though, because I deal with this a lot, 
is when evaluating a marketing budget, if you had to assign a percentage to dollars spent yearly towards branding versus all the other strings that could be on a, on a specific marketing budget with an organization, it, without, without getting into the finite details of how much money to spend on something, how would you generally advise somebody to allocate those dollars, so the percentage of branding versus all the other strains? 20 as a minimum should be spending between 5 and 10% of its annual revenue towards marketing. That's kind of where you want to find your marketing budget allocated. And depending on what projects are on the table, you might want to dedicate, you know, somewhere between 25 to 40% of that budget to your branding. If it's, you know, a year where you're doing a rebrand or reintegrating your brand or really looking to redo your entire online presence, things of that nature. Um, keeping that in mind, what's really important to understand is you need to amortize the investment in branding over the lifetime of that project, right? So what I mean by that is if your new brand should last you a decade, you really want to amortize that over 10 years, right? Um, and then that helps kind of understand what the annual cost, quote unquote, would be. Uh, that's one way to look at it. Another really important thing to understand is even though 5 to 10% is, you know, kind of a general benchmark for a marketing budget to sustain growth, if you're a new entry into the marketplace or you're entering new markets or you're looking to grow substantially and gain market share, you may want to devote a bit more of your budget towards that. But again, looking at marketing budgets overall, 5 to 10% of your revenue, maybe a little bit more if you're focused on growth. And then within that budget, generally between 25 and 40% is a really good benchmark for what you want to allocate towards your brand initiative. Great, yeah. Um, so this is Stephanie again, and I'm just going to kind of like jump backwards a little bit. Um, so let's say, you know, you've got your, your brand, you've got it figured out, um, you've got your messaging on point, you've got everything budgeted. Um, so then how do you get your employees to promote that brand uh, without standing, sounding like they're pre-programmed with the message, you know? So how do, how do you get them to make it their own and feel ownership in it? Sure. So training, 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 training is the answer to that question, right? When you prepare to relaunch your brand or rebrand your venture, uh, bring your team on board to a certain extent and making them a part of the process from the outset as an insight team can be incredibly helpful so that they feel aligned and in the loop. And then from there, once that brand is rolled out, once you have specific messaging, you know, I don't ever want staff to feel scripted but I do want them to have a framework they're going to follow when they're engaging with customers, when they're engaging with prospects, so on and so forth. So keeping that in mind, um, it's going to be really, really important to give people key messages, key words to use, but not verbatim words for word scripting them. Because as you're well aware, that can come off sounding incredibly stiff and unnatural. Thank you. I love that. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, this is Evan again. How do you clearly separate yourself from the competition in terms of branding? My answer, you know, I, this is the most boring part of the work we do, but it's the first step and the most important one, is market research, right? The only way you can set yourself apart and rise above your competitors is if you know everything possible about them. So that's not just browsing their website, although it's part of it. It's secret shopping them. It's understanding you know, their market position, understanding who their buyer is and what their kind of um, – key messages they're really trying to, you know, get into the marketplace are. So you can make sure you're doing something different that you don't stand out similar. So the best way to find your value competitors is to know every possible about them. That is again, you know, super shopping them, marketing, understanding their strategy in the marketplace, all very, very important. And another thing I would say is draw inspiration from other industries, right? If you are a retirement senior living community, maybe you want to draw inspiration from the luxury, you know, vacation industry. Maybe you want to draw inspiration from the retail industry. Maybe you want to draw inspiration from fashion, right? There's any number of places where you can draw inspiration. Doing things outside your industry so you don't look and sound like everyone else in your particular vertical. That is great advice, Adam. I, I love from pulling out the outside. I think many times we get too tied into looking at our uh, own industry. And by the way, this is Ryan. Um, I, have, I do have another question for you. Sure. Just in your experiences with branding, what are some of the most common mistakes you see organizations make around branding? 
So the biggest mistake I see, and unfortunately this is a very, very common one, is the fact that, you know, people think, oh, well, we don't have a brand at our company. But the reality is you have a brand whether a company realizes it or not, right? Your prospective customers are talking about you. Your existing customers are talking about you. Your competitors are talking about you. So why not design that brand and create a strategy to brand your organization with intent and really just a sense of purpose rather than letting it happen haphazardly? So I'd say the biggest mistake I see companies making is not defining their brand at all and kind of just letting the marketplace dictate that which may go one way or another, and usually it doesn't go the way that a company would, you know, really intend if they had, you know, overseen the process from day one. So the first mistake, again, is that people just think, you know, our organization doesn't have a brand and they don't put any thought into it. So that's mistake number one. Mistake number two is maybe they hire a college freelancer to make their logo and they find someone offshore to make their website. And, you know, they have someone, you know, an intern in the marketing department uh, write their website content. So everything has just been done with cut corners, and it doesn't leave with the impact that it would make if it was done strategically and really all in tandem. So between cutting corners in terms of what they're investing in their brand, and a brand really is an investment, um, and not doing a brand, you know, with intention, those are probably the two biggest issues I run into. Thanks a lot, Adam. I think that, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Definitely. Hey, Adam, what are some great ways to promote value proposition? Sure. So, again, one of my favorites, of course, is a tagline, um, right, which should be a really nice and succinct summary of what your company's value proposition is versus your value proposition. So I would say leveraging social media hashtags is a really nice way as is your tagline, and as you're developing content, whether it's for a website, whether it's for a brochure, whether it's for an internal training uh, initiative, really developing key messages that you're going to thread through your content over and over again are also incredibly fundamental. Hey, Adam, it's Aubrey. Hey, Aubrey. <laughs> so as, as you know, so many companies are terrified to like, rebrand, right? So what are some of the biggest red flags that are a clear indication that they need to really just scrap everything they have and just rebrand entirely? Usually when there's a red flag that it's time to rebrand, something has changed for your company, right? It could be that a new competitor, maybe one that relates to technology, has entered the marketplace and is taking market share. It could be that maybe at one point in time your organization has had reputation issues, and now that you've mitigated those, you really want to start with a clean slate. That's a really nice opportunity to rebrand as well. Um, another way and you know, see a red flag is if you have changed your offerings, maybe you've moved into a slightly different market space, maybe you've added a new division to the company, possibly through an acquisition or a merger, um, and really your old brand doesn't adequately describe what you're serving and who you're serving now, those are all really good red flags to make sure that, you know, you really start to think about rebranding because the worst thing an organization can do is not rebrand in the midst of change. And before they know it, their message becomes diluted. And in turn, they become somewhat irrelevant in the marketplace, which is, as you can imagine, a very slippery slope. So usually it's a red flag to rebrand when there's key changes in your company, whether it is new, a new service line, whether it is possible past reputation issues that you've mitigated. It could be that you have seen your competitor landscape change quite substantially. Those are all really opportune times to look at rebranding. And then one more quick question on rebranding. Uh, when it comes to that and scrapping the entire name of a company, the entire logo, the colors, I mean, um, how often do you recommend companies actually do that? So as far as changing your name, I would only like to change an organization's name if there's a reason for it, like some of the red flags I described to you some time ago. The visuals of a brand, you can typically, you know, evolve those every five to ten years 
uh, maybe 15 years, you've got a really timeless logo. I like to use the example of Starbucks, right? They've refreshed their logo several times since their inception, but the core of it has never really changed, right? So refreshes like that are perfectly applicable every five to 10 years. But like you said, a total rebrand, changing the name, changing the color, changing everything, generally it's whenever there's a reason for it, right? Well, like it's not just, oh, your marketing department's feeling kind of bored and they want to do something new. That's not a good reason to rebrand. Again, it's really a matter of looking at what has changed and what does your company need to evolve to remain relevant in the marketplace. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, Adam, this is Stephanie again. So you've given us just some really awesome information, but what do you think is the most, like, the best piece, the golden piece of advice that you give to people when it comes to branding? Sure. Well, what I would tell people is two things. The first thing is, you, like I said a bit earlier, your company has a brand, whether your team realizes it or not. So you may as well do it with intention and purpose to make sure that it's conveying the message and the positioning you want. So that's the first thing. And the second thing I would leave people with is, you know, a Coco Chanel quote, but I think it's so relevant and timely, which is, in order to be irreplaceable, one must always be different. I'll say that again. In order to be irreplaceable, one must always be different, right? This, you know, senior living and any industry really in today's competitive market landscape is becoming increasingly commoditized. And if you don't stand out, you really are invisible. So, it, you know, marketing is great, but when you have a strong brand, your marketing is going to be that much more powerful. So those are just a few of the things I would love for people to take away from our conversation today. Um, let's take a minute and open the call up to the council members to talk about some of their favorite brands and what they've done uh, to gain their loyalty. Uh, so, Adam, feel free to jump in at any point, throw in your perspective. Evan, sure. let's have you go ahead and go first. So what brand do you love? What is your branding advice? Yeah, thanks for that, Aubrey. And uh, the brand that I love is Toyota. Um, which is a little odd, but uh, from personal experience, uh, when I hear the word Toyota, um, you know, I think, what do I think to myself, and what do you think to, you know, everyone else in the, in the call, what do you think when that comes to mind? So I think it's stability, dependability, affordable, um, and personally stylish. I've owned two Toyotas in my lifetime, and uh, I plan on sticking with them uh, until my last car purchase, and having, and this is also being said, having, having never owned or driven uh, any other brand. So I own a 4Runner myself and went car shopping the latest times. I've spent almost zero time giving another brand any shot my car buying experience. And I think this is because um, the dependability as well as the affordability. So that's the brand I love. Um, and in my advice, is something that I've learned over time is that you have to be absolutely true to your branded story. Uh, you can also view this as being consistent uh, but your clients talk to others in the industry, and they can mold and develop an image of you whether you like it or not. I want to finish this by saying build your brand on being first class, and everything else will fall into place. Ryan, what brand do you like the most, and what's your advice? Yeah, absolutely. And Evan, I don't, I don't think it's weird that you like Toyota. My, my wife has a Highlander, so she loves it. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, yeah, the brand that I love, and it, it's actually kind of local to where I live in the, in the Mid-Atlantic, is Under Armour. Um, I love it because it, it's a recognizable nationwide um, with its simple yet powerful logo. Um, their, their slogan of work hard, stay comfortable, when you really stop to think about it, that's kind of neat. It, it, it's something I think everyone can really appreciate. Um, they were actually uh, the original and, in, in my opinion, still the best moisture wickening technology out there. I, that, that may sound weird, but if you stop to think about it, whether uh, you're an athlete of any type um, or you're just a day-to-day -day person going to work, using it to, to work outside, it, it's really amazing uh, how they kind of change the game. In fact, the question I ask is how many of us still wear jogging pants to exercise in? Like, nobody. <laughs> uh, they take a lot of pride in their community, their school partnerships, especially in their hometown, which is Baltimore, Maryland. They've partnered with uh, the Olympian Michael Phelps and Ray Lewis and a, a bunch of other well-known uh, celebrity athletes. Uh, going along with that, the one piece of advice I have as far as branding, branding is only as good as the people that represent it. 
And I think this goes along with what Adam was talking about as far as do you want to control it or, or let somebody else control it, is you can have the greatest slogans, visions, and innovations, but it all means nothing if you don't have the people that believe and buy into it. Most importantly, those representing it. Brands only stay relevant, in my opinion, to continue to grow if you have a culture that is ingrained in all that they produce and use the brand. Also, the power of brand can be very good and very bad, uh, or I'll call it the Apple versus Enron effect. Both well-known brands, but <laughs> for very different reasons, if anyone remembers uh, the whole Enron debacle from about 15 years ago. I think so it's brand a great example. Is, right? So branding yep. is not solely the, the responsibility of all the marketing and sales teams. It's really for everyone who receives a paycheck from the organization. So, you know, that's, that, that's what I think. Nick, I'm just curious, what, what do you think? Or, or Stephanie, Stephanie or Nick, which, whoever yeah. wants to answer no, I, that one. I completely, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yep, I completely agree with that, um, you know, and, and basically kind of takes me into, you know, my favorite brand, which is kind of Apple, because, you know, like you said, I mean, the way that they've transformed um, and created a, a culture that everybody knows, um, they've been able to take, you know, devices, right, and things that have been around forever, and people don't think of those as, you know, what they are. It's not a computer. It's a MacBook. They're not headphones. They're AirPods. Um, and being able to do that completely, completely change how people view something um, is, you know, incredible in my opinion. Um, I mean, think of just even the way that you send text messages on an iPhone. It's a completely different message. Everyone knows what an iMessage is versus a text message. Um, and it has a certain, you know, connotation associated with it, um, which, you know, is, is remarkable. Um, you know, but I think in terms of kind of the advice and whatnot, it's just piggybacking on that, what you said, Ryan, and it's all about culture, right, and the people and being able to, you know, promote a brand in a way that does not sound robotic, right? It's not getting all of your team and all of your people to, you know, speak and say the same thing, but it's more to kind of live that, that lifestyle, that, um, that brand in just their day to day uh, to really promote what's going on. I mean, I think that, you know, what we see so much is people who, you know, you go and talk to people in a certain um, company and everything that they say is exactly the same. Um, and it just, that, that might, you know, create the same message in a way, but it seems scripted and fake and whatnot, but more about the way that they kind of live their day-to-day -day life is how we want to kind of promote that culture and that brand. Um, and it can be seen as a lot, you know, a lot less effort in that, um, but a lot more powerful as well. Um, so, you know, Aubrey, what's your kind of brand and advice? Oh, gosh. Um, brands. So many brands that I love. Uh, I guess iHeartMedia. They just uh, rebranded from iHeartRadio, uh, which was a bold move. But like you said, Adam, you know, they, they're not just radio anymore. They offer everything. So it was time to showcase that. So in my opinion, they're killing it lately. Everywhere I go, I hear about iHeart, whether it's a new podcast or a new award ceremony, advertising opportunities. At this point, I am 100% captivated and engaged. Uh, so, yeah, they're doing a wonderful job lately. Um, when it comes to advice, oh, gosh, in my opinion, um, a brand to me is brought to life really in the mind of the prospect. Uh, so they decide uh, what you stand for and essentially determine if the experience of the brand is promising or what they're promising them. Is it true and is it relevant? I find it's really important for brands to have a very clear identity. So the vision, the mission, the brand promise all need to be developed and fine-tuned. Um, they say your vision is the ultimate dream. Your mission is how you achieve those goals. And the brand promise is, um, is the positive difference that you'll deliver along the way. So, you know, branding is, is always changing. The landscape is forever changing. Um, Adam, any last thoughts? I mean, what do you think? 
I think you raised a really relevant example with iHeartMedia really rebranding. I'm going to give you an example of another brand that's really struggling to stay relevant and has been for some time, and that is Yellow Pages, right? They were for years and decades known as the go-to for advertising, right, getting your full-page ad in that big yellow phone book. And marketing has evolved so much in the past 15, 20 years that even though Yellow Pages now does offer a variety of digital marketing services, they aren't known for that. Their positioning isn't known for that. So they really are struggling to maintain that relevancy. So that's one thing I wanted to say. Favorite brand would probably be De Beers Diamonds. Um, until the late 19th century, diamonds were kind of a commodity. They really weren't anything of a luxury item. And then as De Beers developed and found diamond mines in the African continent, they really transformed diamonds into a luxury with this tagline, a diamond is forever. They turned diamonds into the symbol of eternal love. And now here we are in 2019 with people practically mortgaging their homes to get an engagement ring. So that is just to me such a powerful example of how the right message, the right positioning, and the right brand can take an item from something that was really quite a commodity to being one of the most prized luxury goods we have on the planet today. So that's probably my favorite brand, to be honest with you. Adam, when it comes to the staff and when it comes to bringing everybody up, I mean, you say training, training, training. Yep. But what are some other things that you can tell business owners? Like, how do you train, right? Like, what does that training look like? Let's dive into that for a minute. Definitely. Well, I would, you know, in a brand training, you know, and we do put these together for our teams uh, of our clients' businesses as well, is talking about what the message and theme we want buyers to understand is, what the key advantages are. Again, like I said, we're never going to script anyone, but we do want to empower them with that key information and, you know, those sound bites, if you will, so they can really understand how to communicate effectively, right? For example, you know, I'll use senior living as an example. You know, if one phone, you know, person is taking an inbound lead and they describe your, you know, offerings one way, and then another describes it as something completely different, I mean, you've got a chaotic sales team, right? So they really do need to be aligned and on board. And um, so the best way to do that, like I said, is conveying the theme, really telling your brand story to your team, empowering them with that information, empowering them with key messages they should be conveying again, not only to prospective customers, but to your existing clientele as well to hopefully, you know, if someone is referring someone to, you know, your residences, um, really helping them understand that. So I would say really empowering them with a story, key messages, and really brief, sync sound bites um, rather than scripting them word for word. That can be really fundamental in your training process. Well, Adam, like I said at the beginning, you are absolutely delightful. Uh, thank you for joining the Keynote Council today. Uh, we've had such a wonderful time. Um, if you're listening to this call and you would like to reach out to Adam directly or learn more about what he does for companies around the United States, even Canada, you can find him at brandingmd.co. Again, that's brandingmd.co. Thank you so much.